the researcher for the research study collects the data and intends to generalize the findings from the sample to the population. We have already seen that the statistics refers to the sample whereas parameters refer to the population. We will see what kind of statistics are used for describing the distribution as well as inferring the findings. There are two types of statistics, one is descriptive statistics and other is inferential statistics. In this session we will see what is descriptive statistics. The descriptive statistics describes the sample. Generally when we collect the data we prepare distributions. Now this distribution has to be described and for that purpose we use descriptive statistics. The moment we use the word statistics we know that it is applicable to the sample. So the descriptive statistics provide simple summaries of the sample. They also can be represented by graphical representation. We will see that what are different types of graphs available to us for describing the sample. As opposed to descriptive statistics, another type of statistic is inferential statistics. There we don't intend only to describe the sample, describe the distribution, but we want to infer. So that means from the sample, we want to infer about the population. We make a judgment about the population from the data which we have collected through a sample. This kind of statistics is called inferential statistics. For example, T ratio or F ratio or chi square, all these statistics are used to infer. Whereas the descriptive statistics can be listed as central tendency, variability, the shape of the distribution, as well as the graphical representation. Sometimes the descriptive statistics are adequate to describe the sample, describe the distribution and we stop there. But sometimes we want to go ahead and these are not adequate. So then we, from, we go from descriptive statistics to inferential statistics. We will see in detail about descriptive statistics. When there is only one variable, this statistics is called univariate. When there are more two variables, we call it bivariate analysis. In univariate analysis, the kind of statistics which we use this can be listed like central tendency, variability, the shape of a distribution and the characteristic of a variable distribution in graphical or tabular form. We will see in detail what are different measures for all these. Let us see central tendency. There are three measures generally which we use are mean, median and mode. The variability is shown by range or standard deviation. The variability is of two types, one is dispersion and other is spread. The dispersion is shown with range or the quantiles. The spread is shown by variance and standard deviation. The shape of a distribution is generally described using skewness and kurtosis, whereas the graphical formats which we generally use are histograms, pie graphs or even ogive. We will see each one of these in detail. When the sample consists of more than one variable, instead of using univariate analysis, we use bivariate analysis. Now there are variety of bivariate analysis measures available to us. They can be listed like this. Cross tabulation and contingency tables, graphical representation via scatter plots, quantitative measures of dependence, descriptions of conditional distributions. When we want to describe the relationship between two variables, we use bivariate analysis and one of the important measures is correlation. Under correlation, we can have different types of correlation. Generally, which we use are Pearson's R, when both variables are continuous, Spearman's row, R H O, row, Spearman's row, when one or both are not continuous and the third one is covariance. When we want to use analysis of variance, analysis of covariance, covariance is useful there. 
This reflects the scale variables are measured on. Now let us see each one of these in detail. Let us see the univariate analysis and the measures are central tendency measures. As I said earlier, there are generally we use three types of central tendency measures, mean, median and mode. What is mean? We also call it average. It is a mathematical average. Average means we add up all the numbers, the scores and divide by the number. So, generally it is denoted as summation of x upon n that gives us the average or the mean. But when you have 10 or 30 you can do this, but if you have 500, 1000 cases you will have to use different methods or you will have to use software packages like SPSS or R which would give you a mean. We are not going into the details of how to calculate mean, but we are going to see the characteristics of it and when to use mean as compared to other central tendency measures. We have seen that mean is calculated by adding all the scores and divided by n, the total number of scores. That is why if your extreme scores are very different. So, in a class of 50, if you have students who have score 1 and who also scored 100, that means if you add them, your mean is going to be affected by the extreme scores. It is the most stable we call it, but it is affected by the extreme scores. Mean is generally used when the distribution is normal. The scores are scattered evenly in the distribution. Every distribution has a midpoint. This midpoint shows that the distribution has a balance. Now, if the scores are scattered around it systematically, then in that case we can use mean. Mean is also used for further statistics. Suppose we want to calculate T ratio, you will require mean. That means you want to find out the difference between two means whether it is significant or not. You want to see the interaction effect of two or three variables, then we go for factor analysis, we go for F ratio. All these higher statistics would need mean because it is more stable measure of central tendency. Other measure of central tendencies is median. Median is found exactly in the middle of the distribution. Median is a score and how the score is located? We have to find out the midpoint and on that midpoint which score is located? That is the median. See this example, there are seven scores. 1, 5, 6, 7, 14, 18 and 61. We have arranged them on an ascending order. Out of 7, the midpoint is the fourth score. And what is that score? That score is 7. So, median of this distribution is 7. Now, let us see another example where the distribution has 8 scores. 1, 5, 6, 7, 9, 14, 18 and 61. Here the midpoint is not exact midpoint, so we have to find out the midpoint will lie between 4th and 5th scores. The 4th score is 7 and 5th score is 9. So, if we find out the average of this, that becomes a midpoint that is 7 plus 9 upon 2 is 8. So, median of this distribution is 8. This is where we are calculating median by arranging the scores in descending or ascending order. If the scores are small in number, you can do that. But if the scores are higher than 500, 300, 1000, then you cannot go on adding them. You have to use different formula or you have to use statistical packages. But we must remember the median is the score located at the midpoint of the distribution. So, now you will see that the two extremes really do not bother this median because what is the score on this side or that side is not a concern of median. Median is only the midpoint. So, it will only show you the middle point and the score situated there as opposed to mean. Mean is affected because you add up and then you divide by the number. Here there is no addition. We only find out the score sitting in the middle. So, this is not affected by extreme scores. When we need to find out the midpoint of the distribution, instead of using mean, we use median. You have also seen that median, while computing median, we do not take into consideration 
the extreme scores. We are only interested in the midpoint. So, median does not get affected by the extreme scores. That is an advantage of median. So, when we have a distribution ranging from 1 to 100, that kind of heterogeneity, it is advisable that we go for median because median is not affected by the extreme scores. We will see this example of computing mean and median of a given distribution. The distribution is the same 1, 5, 6, 7, 14, 18 and 61. We have seen that midpoint shows median as 7. Now, let us see what is the mean. Mean means you have to add all the scores and divide by 7. So, summation of x is equal to 112 divided by 7 is 16. You see a difference? Median is 7 while mean is 16. Mean gets affected by the extreme score on the right hand side you have seen it is 61. So, you have to select as a researcher, you have to select judiciously appropriately the measure of central tendency which is more suited to your distribution. I will give you one example, you want to find out the value people attach to different vocations. See vocations are like doctor, teacher, tailor, whatever. So, you have a list of 100 such vocations and you want to find out the value attached to that, social value. If you give it to say 100 people, significant people in the society and ask them to rate these 100 vocations. Each vocation, say for example, teacher, it will have 100 values. Now, instead of having mean, you can find out the median. Median can be calculated which gives you the median point, that the middle point, the midpoint of the distribution. So, there are some uh, situations, occasions where a researcher may be interested in finding out median and using that to describe the distribution. You know that median is not affected by extreme situation, extreme scores. So, naturally when the scores are not systematically arranged around the midpoint, we generally use the median. When you know that the dispersion is too high, scores are varied, then you know that mean will be affected and at that time you can use median instead of mean. The third measure of central tendency is mode. The mode tells you the peak. Say for example, when we say what is today's fashion, if you see uh, 100 women, 90 women are wearing saris. So, the mode of the dress or the fashion is a sari. The mode is described as the highest number of people showing that score, that is the highest frequency. So, in a distribution, you have 3 times 1, 5 times 10, 17 times 18, 20 times 45 and so on. So, 20 times 45 are appearing, that means the mode is 45, because that is the maximum frequency of that score. This is a very crude measure of central tendency. But when you need a quick and approximate measure, we use mode. But otherwise, as you know, we will go to median or if you want to go further ahead for with the statistics, you will prefer mean. It is possible that a distribution can be unimodal or it can be bimodal also. That means, we have seen this example of 45 score appearing 20 times. There can be another score like 17 also appearing 20 times in a distribution. So, there can be two modes instead of one. So, the distribution is either unimodal or bimodal. Mean, median and mode are measures of central tendency. If you see a normal probability curve, you will find that mean, median and mode have the same value. That is the scores are normally distributed among the mean. The midpoint is exactly on that and mode is also there. So, it is very difficult to achieve this, but if you have mean, median and mode same, then naturally that distribution itself is normal. Let us now see the measures of variability. We have seen that the dispersion can be shown by using a very crude measure that is range. 
range is an interval between the highest and the lowest score. So, if the lowest score is 4 and highest score is 40, the range will be 4 to 40 that means 36. If n is small, then you do not have lot of control and the range becomes quite unreliable. As it is very crude measure of variability and n is small, then it really gets affected. Let us see one example of data set. Scores are 15, 16, 17, 18 and 55. What is the range? The lowest is 15, highest is 55. So, range is 40. Let us see another example. The scores are 15, 25, 35, 45. Still the range is 40. Here the scores are evenly spread. The first example showed you that scores were towards left hand side 15, 16, 17, 18 all scores were on left hand side and the last score was 55. See in both the cases range is 40. Now let us see one more example. If the scores are 15, 25, 35, 45 and instead of 55 it is 105. What is the range? Range gets affected immediately because of that one score which is the highest score. So the range here is 90. 105 minus 15. We have seen that it is unreliable, but it is a very crude measure. It gives us an idea how the scores are dispersed in a distribution. There is another measure which is called quantile. There are variety of quantiles, but what is a quantile? These are the cut points on a distribution. Quantiles are cut points dividing the range of probability distribution into contiguous intervals with equal probabilities or dividing the observation in a sample in the same way. So, quantiles if you want to see quantiles is one fewer than the number of groups you want to create. So, for example, median is a quantile. When you find a median that means you are finding out the midpoint. So, you are dividing the distribution into 2. So, 2 minus 1. So, median will be giving you one score it is one fewer than the groups which you are creating. If you create four groups, that means there will be three cut points. Median is divided into two, so there is only one cut point. If you are working on percentiles, you will be dividing that with the 99 cut points. You see a diagram here which shows median as a quantile. It is two quantiles. That means there is only one cut point and you get a midpoint that is median. Another example, if you have four sections, that means you have three cut points and you have three quartiles, that is quartile 1, Q1, quartile 2, that is median, quartile 3, that is Q3. You can find out quartile deviation and you also can find out average deviation. So, it is QD or AD. This is also measure of variability. If you are using the percentile as a quantile, that means you are having 99 cut points and you are talking about 100 groups which you are creating across the distribution. It is denoted by P. In variability, we have seen that we are interested to find out how far the scores are varied, how far they are dispersed from the mean. For that, we use variety of measures. One of that measure is standard deviation. Standard deviation is denoted by SD and sigma, the small sigma. When you want to use a more stable measure of variability, we use standard deviation. We also use standard deviation when other statistics is to be used, further statistics for analysis, in-depth analysis, comprehensive analysis, that time we use standard deviation to start with. Standard deviation, the word tells us about a deviation. This deviation is taken from the mean. So, if you see a formula, sigma is equal to square root of sigma x square upon n. Here, sigma x square x is small, that is a deviation from the mean. So, you have to find out first the mean, then take the deviation of each score from the mean, that is denoted by small x, square it and then add it. So, that will give you summation of x square divided by n, total number of scores and then take a square root that becomes SD. Now, we have seen that square root can be plus or minus. So, for example, square root of 4 is 2, 
but it is plus 2 or minus 2 because square of plus 2 is also 4, square of minus 2 is also 4. So, S d has a negative sign, S d can have positive sign. So, we can say that S d is plus 2, we can also say S d is minus 1.5. When you need a statistics with the greater stability, you use standard deviation. As we said earlier, you have quartile deviation, you have range, you have average deviation and you also have standard deviation. Among all these, standard deviation is the most stable statistics which gives you an idea about variability or the dispersion of the scores in a distribution. So, when you need a stable statistics, you use standard deviation. Standard deviation is also used when subsequently you want to use higher statistics including correlation you would be going for standard deviation and not for average deviation or quartile deviation and certainly not for range. When we want to compute SD from the original scores, we can use a formula sigma is equal to square root of summation x square upon n minus m square. And what is m square? m square is equal to sigma x upon n whole square. So, if you put that substitute that value of m square into the formula, you will get sigma is equal to square root of summation x square upon n minus summation x upon n whole square. This is about computing standard deviation of a given distribution. Sometimes it may happen that you have two different sets of distribution with the mean and standard deviation. Now, you want to find out the combined mean and combined standard deviation. Can we do that? Yes, we definitely can do that. That is called standard deviation of combined distribution. Let us see one example. Here there are two groups. Group A has 30 participants, the mean is 60 and their SD is 10. Group B has 70 participants, n is equal to 70, their mean is 80 and their standard deviation is 15. These are the two different sets from the same class. We have two sets. And now, we want to find out the combined SD for both the distributions put together. What is the formula for it? Let us see that. The formula for this is standard deviation of combined distribution is square root of n 1 into bracket sigma 1 square plus d 1 square plus n 2, n 2 is number of the other distribution multiplied by standard deviation of that distribution square plus d square of that distribution and divide it by n and take the square root. In this formula, sigma 1 is SD of distribution 1, sigma 2 is SD of distribution 2, d 1 is a deviation between two means from means when mean 1 minus mean combination and d 2 will be m 2 minus m combination. Now, let us come back to this example we will substitute the values in the given formula. So, standard deviation of combined distribution is equal to here n 1 is 30, sigma 1 is 10, d 1, what is the d 1? We have to find out. How do we find out the d? First, we have to find out the mean combined. Now, how do we find out the mean combined? We have two sets and now how do we first of all find the mean? Mean is you add and then you divide by the number. So, now here the total number will be for group 1 will be 30 multiplied by 60. So, it is 1800. Now, for group 2 n is 70 and mean is 80. So, the total scores are 5600 70 multiplied by 80. So, what is the total score? 1800 plus 5600. Now, this score has to be divided by 100 because n for combined distribution is 100, 30 plus 70. So, that gives you the mean of combination, mean of combined distribution that is 74. This mean of combined distribution 74 and you have mean of both the group 1 and group 2. Now, for our formula, we have to find out d. What is d? d is a difference between mean of group 1 and mean of combined distribution. So, let us put the values, substitute the values there and we get the standard deviation of combined distribution is equal to 30 into bracket 100 plus 196, 100 is SD square. So, for this it is SD is 10, so square is 100. 
the deviation is found by 74 minus 60 that is 14, 14 square is 196. Similarly, you have to substitute the values for N2, N2 is 70, SD is 15, so square is 225 plus the deviation, deviation is 80 minus 74 is 6, 6 square is 36. So, you have to do this computation and substitute the values. Now, if you solve this, you will get the standard deviation of combined distribution is 16.46. You see the standard deviation of set 1 was 10, standard deviation of group 2 was 15 and now you have got a standard deviation of both the sets together that is combined distribution is 16.46. Variance, we have said it is standard deviation square is variance. It is also a measure of variability of the scores. So, V is equal to sigma square. Variance can be partitioned, standard deviation cannot be partitioned. So, when we want to use higher statistics like ANOVA or ANCOVA or MANOVA, we need partition. So, that time we use variance. This is higher level statistics, we will go step by step and we will see variety of inferential statistics, how to use them, how to compute them, how to infer the findings from sample for the population. But here we must remember that when you want to partition, it is variance which can be partitioned and not the standard deviation and that is why when you go for higher statistics, you use variance. So, we also find out coefficient of variation that is called CV. This is also known as relative variability. So, CV is equal to sigma upon mean. But if you want to show it in terms of percentiles, you can multiply it by 100. So, C V is equal to 100 sigma upon mean. That means, we are talking in terms of percentiles. One more way of describing the distribution is talking about its shape. So, shape of a distribution is also an important aspect for describing the distribution. Now, this can be described using two different statistics. One is called skewness and other one is called kurtosis. Let us see what is skewness. The skewness tells you the diversion of the distribution from the normal distribution curve. We know that if the mean and median have the same values, they fall on the same point, that means the curve is normal, the distribution is normal. If they are not the same, if mean and median have different values, that means the, the distribution is skewed. It can be skewed on both sides, it can be skewed on left hand side, it can be skewed on right hand side. Means, it can be positively skewed or it can be negatively skewed. See these two figures. On the right hand side, you see a positively skewed distribution. That means, it has a longer tail on the right hand side. That means, the scores are on the higher side. Whereas, on the left hand side, you see a negatively skewed distribution where the longer hand is on the left hand side, that is the lower scores. It is called negatively skewed distribution. The symmetrical or normal probability curve will have 0 skewed. If the skewness is greater than 1 or less than minus 1, the skewness is substantial and the distribution is far from symmetrical. This is also a thumb rule. If you want to compute skewness, you can use this formula SK is equal to 3 into mean minus median upon sigma, standard deviation. If you want to talk in terms of percentile, you can use this formula SK is equal to P90 plus P10 upon 2 minus P50, P is percentile. So, first you have to find out the value of percentile 90, percentile 10, percentile 50 and then substitute the values to get the skewness. We know that if the skewness is 0, the distribution is perfectly normal, but you will not find out a perfectly normal distribution, it is very difficult. So, there will be skewness, so we must know whether this distribution is highly skewed or not skewed to a great extent. Bulmer has given the rules of thumb. Let us see, if the skewness is less than minus 1 or greater than plus 1, the distribution is highly skewed. So, the range is minus 1 to plus 1, in between 0, 0 is normal, minus 1 to plus 1. 
if here skewness is less than minus 1 or greater than plus 1, it is highly skewed. In between 0 to 1, you have 0.5 and on this side also 0 to minus 1, you have minus 0.5. Now we have, if the skewness is between minus 1 and minus 0.5, this is called moderately skewed. Similarly, plus 1 and plus 0.5 in between that, then that is also moderately skewed because we know it can be skewed positively or it can be skewed negatively. The third category is the skewness is between minus 0.5 and plus 0.5 through 0. This distribution is called approximately symmetric distribution. So, when you have your distribution, you are interested to describe it in terms of diversion from the normal probability curve and for that you will compute skewness and then describe your distribution accordingly. The second statistics which we use for describing the shape of a distribution is kurtosis. Kurtosis refers to the peakedness. So, how peaked your distribution is or how flat your distribution is, is given by the kurtosis. If you have more peaked distribution, it is called leptokurtic. If you have a flat distribution, less peaked one, it is called platycurtic. You see a diagram here which shows leptocurtic and platycurtic. In between there is a normal score. The flatness is shown by platycurtic and the peakedness is shown by leptocurtic. The leptocurtic also tells you the positive kurtosis and the platycurtic shows you the negative kurtosis because it is flat as compared to the normal and the one which is higher as compared to the normal is positive kurtosis. How to compute kurtosis? Kurtosis is equal to Q upon P90 minus P10. This will give you the kurtosis. You apply that and you know the values, then you can describe your shape of the distribution accordingly.